Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, it's a little bit weird setup. I put the water there. I hope I don't trip it. <laughs> so um, yeah, good afternoon. I'm so glad to be here. I am CL from Taiwan. Um, so today I will be sharing some of my learnings with you and hopefully learn some uh, from you as well. Uh, so today the topic is about my own journey on open source uh, software, um, about code, about community, and also startup. So a uh, brief introduction about myself. Um, I've, uh, I've been an open source developer for like 25 years. Uh, you see I like coding, uh, even in the hospital. I previously built open source uh, product that was uh, used by Apple and TSMC. And then um, for the past 10 years, I've been building the civic tech community in Taiwan and also beyond Taiwan called GovZero. Uh, I will talk about that in a bit. Uh, but it's really about applying open source um, to a context where how do we make societal impact in not just the result, but also the way we do open source. All right, but most recently, I've been working on a new um, data product called uh, Recky. It's a new concept, actually. Uh, it's all about making data productive. So I'll dive into that a little bit as well. But really, um, I'm going to start with um, the goal for the talk today. Uh, is really open source is not just about software. It's also the spirit that help us iterate faster and collaborate autonomously. So if you are involved in open, open source software, contribute to that, you must fail that. So I encourage you to apply this to various parts of your life or other projects, non-software projects even. So basically the open source way. So let's begin. So here's my uh, very first open source contribution. I looked it up uh, when someone asked me. <laughs> and then, yeah, it was very silly, a couple of lines of change about almost 25 years ago now. Um, I was a high school student, right? Any high school students here? No? <laughs> so basically, I was tinkering the code and then various open source projects at that time, Apache Web Server, uh, FreeBSD, some Linux, and then I was sending patch to them, right? And then I was frustrated by version control system. All right, so I think everyone uses Git nowadays, right? But you probably don't know, like maybe 25 years ago, there's no Git. There's only uh, CVS or at that time, Subversion, if you know, if you're like old enough to know, there's a centralized version control system. So it's very frustrating um, because it's, it's centralized, which means that if you are traveling, if you are in a remote area, you do not have internet access, you don't have a proper tool to work with software. So the solution is to create something that we are now very familiar with, what, how Git works, a decentralized version of a version control system where you can work offline. But I think no one at that time, I think there are about 10 or uh, less than 10 projects doing a uh, decentralized version control system. And then no one saw the killer feature for a decentralized version control system is actually a centralized one, which is a GitHub. So basically, um, anyway, uh, back then I created one, and then that kind of allowed forking by default. And then if you know back in then, forking was possible with other version control system, but it's very, it has a very different cultural meaning. If you're forking Python, you are um, becoming an enemy of a state or something, right? But nowadays, forking is by default. You fork and you make changes, you propose changes, right? So it's a huge paradigm shift about how software developers collaborate. Now, of course, Git took over like uh, 2005 and then the killer thing in GitHub is really pull request. Now, think about it, the concept is less than 20 years old, and then we are so used to it. We cannot work or live without the concept pull request anymore, right? So it enabled, it's a higher concept that enabled all the CI CD system or the DevOps, or if you work on um, large open source projects like Kubernetes, you see a lot of automation built on top of pull request. So it's that higher concept, when we scale that concept, that becomes the community uh, to have fast iteration and also autonomous collaboration uh, for building software. Now, really, that's a game changer. And then um, 
there are two other types of pull requests I want to dive in today. So, but really, it's about applying the open source concept and working model that we are used to, to community building, uh, organization building, and even societal change or any kind of in innovation. All right, so uh, the first thing I'll cover is about the story for uh, Gov0. It's a massive collaboration on civic tech. So that's a lot of work here, but let's dive in. Um, so I, I mentioned I, I've been doing software for a long time, and I would consider myself being pretty apolitical, as in you're kind of traveling around nomadic geek. You don't really care about how kind of the government works, right? And then uh, until one day, um, you started to care, right? And then you see uh, that is very frustrating. Uh, I like to quote, maybe some people heard of um, uh, every happy family look alike, but like unhappy family are very old, have their own story, right? So every happy democracy look alike. Are there any happy democracies? I don't know. <laughs> but very, every un unhappy democracy had their own problems, right? So really it's all about kind of all this opaque decision making, injustice, and then uh, like, d like the dysfunctional uh, journalism, like all the, the disinformation, all that. And then, and then really, the problem is that at that time, the, our technology has enabled us to bring half a million people onto the street, like Arab Spring or uh, anywhere you know about all the big protests. But it's not enabling us to make decision as a collective. So it's very hard to scale kind of rational deliberation or discussion. So that frustrates me. And then you see how this goes, right? So uh, Gov0 is an effort to fork the government. Uh, not the other word with the F and then start with the K <laughs> and then with the K. Right? The idea is really how can we as technologists build the type of um, government work like we want it to work like. And then basically we don't want to actually run the government, right? But we can pull request that this to the government, right? Try this work, this works, people like it. This will bring up your approval rate and so on. So essentially it's bringing open source uh, method and using technology and then working on projects that is about the public space, about the, the, um, the civic space, and then really a hands-on spirit like us, we're just tinkering with code, right? So we're tinkering with some of the projects that help people work together. So I will show you maybe just two projects. This is a building in Taiwan that hoards all the campaign finance registry files. So campaign finance is kind of the legal money you can collect uh, when you run for election, right? So these are very civilized. You need to declare them so there is no like dark money. Uh, or there are dark money, but these are at least the declared ones. So it used to be you have to go into this building and then present, surrender your ID, and then uh, they can provide you a copy. They don't provide you digital uh, files because who knows what kind of analytics or best storytelling you're going to do, right? So um, they're playing for the safe. So one of the uh, Gov0 project was to mobilize a few thousand people to go in there every day, right? Give the ID card to them every day and then print out document, put it in the Google Drive every day. So very quickly, uh, there were tons of, uh, like thousands of pages of this uh, campaign finance files. And then, well, obviously, the next thing you build is a CAPTCHA game for everyone to be able to participate, right? So the first batch of data is about 300,000 entries. And then it's not that we cannot do OCR, but it's more fun for more people to participate. So this batch of data, in the, within the first 24 hours, there are over 10,000 people uh, who participated in this, trying to digitize, because they feel they're contributing, right? As open source contributor, you feel you're contributing. But if we bring this to other scenarios, how do we help people feel they're contributing? They're helping the cause they wanted to help. So with that, we enabled um, journalists or other um, <clears throat> citizen to do an analytics on kind of what's the clustering for uh, different industry, where does the money go, uh, to which party, which candidate, etc. So that becomes a very um, interesting project to um, basically <clears throat> show how the money flow through 
the whole system. Now, if we try to visualize this over the, the, the multi-year effort, you will see this as a pull request to democracy. On the purple box, um, it's like kind of the original campaign finance in analog form. It took about five years, or actually more than five years, because before nobody cared about this, right? So it, it took us multiple years to get to a regulation change that this file can be provided digitally. But at the same time, we are impatient, right? So we don't want to be blocked by this slow process. We want it to, to be pragmatic. So this is where GovZero forked the government, right? We, well, we still propose a regulation change, anticipating this will take years. Um, but there's the GovZero crowdsource OCR data set. Now, the journalist or anyone who uh, can just make use of this data. So liberating that data and then also um, pull requests that systematic change that we wanted to happen. So fast forward five years later, uh, the data was provided so uh, all the analysis can switch to a form formal proper uh, data source to use that. Um, does anyone know what this flag is about? Anyone recognize this? Hmm? Italy? No. <laughs> Anyone? Thailand? No. Island? What island? All right. It's the Milk Tea Alliance flag. <laughs> Did I say I'm glad to be here? <laughs> okay. So why, like, um, like I say, like every unhappy democracy have their own stories. Um, so this is where, like, the interesting thing about Gov Zero projects because it's transporter. The first project I did was a budget visualization tool that was later used in Hong Kong and uh, Brazil. And then um, there was a very popular uh, crowdsource fact-checking uh, tool in Taiwan called Cofax. Uh, it was inspiring uh, the uh, Thailand version of that, so Cofax. Does anyone know that per, uh, pink Cofax? Anyone? Yeah, okay, I see some. All right, so this is like a very interesting uh, way of uh, tackling misinformation because a lot of those misinformation are kind of within the private groups. So COFAC kind of creates a bot that infiltrates your own group and then help you do the fact checking. Um, so it's basically a crowdsource fact check, but the, more importantly, really, it's, it's one of the Gov Zero projects and then it, because it's open source, uh, not just the source code, but kind of the working model, kind of um, the way the community is organized that allows that to be really as open source replicated uh, here. So again, to recap on kind of the pull request to uh, democracy, um, really it's, it's how do we, because uh, like every democracy has its own problem, how do we address this in a scalable way, in a contextual way where uh, people who care about them can work? So, like, traditionally, really, it's uh, only in election that we are making a commit to a new version of democracy or continue that previous version of democracy, right? So how do we do pull requests more often? How do we do, or well, when and how do we do those code reviews? It's really about ingest, like, inserting a lot of observability into our system, and then that observability becoming uh, uh, comes from all the open data or uh, like the campaign finance monitoring, public spending, and then everything uh, that is related to kind of the public service. So basically, GovZero or generally broader Civitech is an attempt to create that kind of observability. But more than that is creating that community who care about all this and then being able to iterate and collaborate autonomously for making policy changes. All right, so um, a lot of the data projects are uh, kind of born out of uh, the Gov Zero, like legislation data, how do we uh, propose the law change, how, who, pro uh, who voted to approve that. So that's one of my interests as well, legislation data. And then budget data, and then public spending data, and all that. So a lot of data projects originated in, in the Gov Zero community. That creates another uh, frustration for me. You see, I'm easily frustrated. 
<laughs> right? So data is a lot of topic about, I guess, 30% of this uh, conference topic is about data. And uh, it's great that a lot of data projects are uh, making the infrastructure a lot better. Um, but there's like the underlying problem, this complex type of workload and ad hoc nature of things. And then um, in most organizations, things are being thrown over the wall. Uh, people who are responsible for part of the data pipeline and then part of the consumption, et cetera. And the tooling is just very, very fragmented. Um, if you see this engine and how is this um, kind of modern data infrastructure, uh, unified architecture. Um, who's seen this before? <laughs> A few of you? OK, so many boxes, right? And then this is, like, this is not going to solve more pro the, all the problems. It's going to create some more problems. It's solving some problem, creating more problem, right? So here's where I, I'm thinking about um, we used to see like kind of the data system being uh, kind of a stateful thing, right? And then the previous talk was about Monad, like we don't like side effects, right? <laughs> and then so the database is somewhere uh, we shuffle those side effects in. Now, in modern days, I think we're trying to uh, see this, can we treat this data system as code as well? Like what DevOps is doing to uh, the traditional in infrastructure. Can we see infrastructure as code? Right, so now can we see data infrastructure or data pipeline as code? Now this creates an interesting problem that what if you can pull request some parts of this chart, right? And then where is gonna be a problem? So right now there's pen point here and there. Like you make changes to your data system, something downstream production breaks. And then you might have observability to find out, yes, uh, there's a problem, now go fix it. Can we do it better? Can we do it like in pull request time? So luckily, uh, these days, I think DBT is very uh, popular, getting traction for kind of transformation as code. So that really, um, I think, brings a lot of possibility. We're seeing a lot of uh, software engineering practice being brought to the data world, where uh, we now have uh, the capability to pull request a transformation pipeline, right? And then, but the question is really, they're still a little bit different uh, between data pipeline and traditional software projects. Here's an example that we, we wanted to achieve. Um, before, it's really about you make changes to your data infra, right? And then something, you, you, might, don't, you might think that it will break or not. You do some basic testing, and then if it breaks, then somebody has to fix it, right? So what, I, what we are envisioning is really you can f also fork your whole uh, data infra and then uh, do a pull request and then review this pull request, and then be very confident when you merge the change. Now, this is a very high-level concept. When you go into the detail, it's a lot of problems in this kind of uh, system and design. Now, like, there are a lot of te uh, data testing tools, and then also uh, people are doing CI for data nowadays. But this is really not enough, because in software, uh, the more tests, the better. We are more confident when the coverage is high and then uh, all the tests are passing, right? But in data, most of the tests is about the current status, right? Are there duplicates? Are there like out of range stuff? It doesn't cover all the cases because if you know something will break, you will have created a test, right? So most of the time, the thing that cause problem are the things not tested. So this is pretty tautological. Right? Are you going to add more tests or uh, but you also find out all the, those things are broken once they're broke, right? So really, um, the problem we, we dug into this deeper is that the more tests you have, uh, the more noise you have for in the data context. So how do we do with that? Really, it's about controlling uh, the aperture about how deep you want to look into the data change. But first, like, I'd, I'd like to mention, like I mentioned DBT, and also the kind of uh, cheap uh, data warehouse cloning now really enable you to have a, a different copy of data. But comparing them in full scale is often still pretty expensive. So we are, it's not, like, not feasible to do kind of just like we do a git diff, right? <coughs> so the thing is that um, testing needs to happen not just on the final state of the data. It needs to be happening somewhere between af uh, and after, comparing the bef between, uh, uh, before and after. So how do we do that? Um, here's one way. 
like uh, we're we're still prototyping this. Um, this is a DAG with an annotation of changes. So just like imagine diff, right? But it's a diff on the DAG. The green one is the edit node, and then the red one is the remove node, and then the others, the the orange ones are impacted ones. So you should probably review those impacted ones in the granularity that uh, the pull request author or the stakeholder agreed on, right? Uh, for this change, uh, we should do a full sweep of, of uh, any differences. Or for that kind of low risk change, it's okay if there's no schema differences. So this is something uh, we are currently working on that's pretty uh, DBT specific, and then um, it's also open source. <coughs> Did I put a URL somewhere? Um, but anyway, uh, this is still pretty early, and then uh, if you're working with DBT, uh, I'd love to talk to you about this and then uh, see what's your opinion. So like bringing this to like the whole idea that we are uh, talking today is kind of pull requests. The concept pull requests created in the past two decades, can we apply that to um, pull requests to our uh, democratic system, pull requests to our data system, right? And then so in the context of data system, it's about when and how do you do code review as well? And then how much and how deep should you look? And how do you agree on that? Anyway, uh, so this is, again, this is, oh, the, the, the GitHub repo is here. Uh, it's still pretty early, again. Uh, so basically the idea is a live pull request checklist on steroid, making it easy for uh, the pull request author and the reviewer to agree on uh, those proof of correctness and then the impact radius and the risk, and then also the impacted stakeholder are being uh, notified or communicated. Um, so uh, in any case, I, I love to talk to you if you are uh, working in, in this area and then um, have, have or have suffered from this data quality or kind of thinking about how do we branch the data. So um, about 65 years ago, uh, there was a interesting challenge in the UK called the Kramer Prize. So it's a 50,000 pound prize for the first human power aircraft that can complete a figure A flight by human, right? So this prize has been there for 18 years until uh, McCready um, solved that. And then he solved that not by directly attacking this problem, but by redefining this problem. How so? so Usually, it would take um, a couple of months to create an aircraft and test it, right? So he, he first redefined this problem to see, can we find a material that we can uh, build an aircraft or fix an aircraft within hours, right? So by reducing the time to create an aircraft to run a test, he was able to do 400 runs uh, to achieve that. So imagine another person uh, doing 400 trials of an aircraft that would take an amounts to build. Uh, this is much longer. So really, iteration, how you fast you can iterate, uh, defines like, how you can get to the result quicker. There, th these are two interesting uh, books, um, oh, both, both published uh, earlier this year. I, I want to share with you, this is super relevant. Um, the first is The Geek Way. And then it's really talking about all the things we know from, as a geek, right? <laughs> like, but in a business context, why uh, companies like Netflix or all those uh, companies can move so fast, can be very innovative? It boils down to four factors, according to the author. It's called the so-so culture. Well, not so-so culture. It's the science, ownership, speed, and openness. Where openness is about basically the, the, the kind of the essence and the spirit in this open source community where you are not defensive, you are appreciation, appreciative to uh, feedback, right? And, and so you probably already know all this that work, like Agile and then uh, the way of collaboration and then uh, data-driven and all that. But this book dives into a deeper level about why this methodology work, because it's trying to be defending against our uh, human nature, according to the author, of um, like the human being very easy to be, be uh, having bias, overconfidence, or uh, want to seek status or keep status, or creating bureaucracy. So these are kind of the guardrail uh, against ourselves 
from uh, running into that kind of bad situation. So around the same time, I saw another book. And then, um, this is particularly interesting because I'm, I'm speaking here in, in Asia. Right? So the book is about, uh, it's called East, right? but it's most, mostly centered around China. Uh, but I think the concept applies to many countries here. East being um, exam, uh, using exam that, uh, that was invented about 1,300 years ago for the state to align the incentive of intellectual to uh, the interests of the state. So basically, it's rewarding whoever thinks the, sa the same thing as the leadership thinks. Right? So it's the only way for the people uh, in the academic world will get job. And then from there, uh, this enables uh, the autocracy to create stability and then use technology to enhance that. So if you can put it side by side, I, I actually accidentally see both of them. It's a very interesting um, take that uh, to, to see that contrast. And then, um, so I mean, I mean, this sounds really scary, right? And I think this is a partly explains why so few uh, Asia-originated innovations are truly able to compete with the geek companies embracing this social uh, culture. Basically, I, I, I mean, if you like grew up here around this area, the education system emphasized about being right rather than getting it right. So this is very sounding to me. And then, and then I mean, been, been doing startup, and then, of course, we want to embrace this geek way, but there's kind of like a deep um, cultural influence in, in this area of the world. All right, so um, I want to recap about what we talked about, really, open source is more than just software. It's how we iterate fast and collaborate autonomously. So I want to encourage you to apply this kind of to various parts of your life or other projects, maybe non-technical, um, but if you can find something that these data-driven ideas or this way of uh, enabling other people to contribute will work, that could be something very interesting. So leave the open source and the geek way. So here's my question to you. Um, what frustrates you? <laughs> and then what would you build? So I think working in this field of software uh, gives us great privilege because it has very high leverage and impact because we, everything we do it potentially is used by a lot of people. Right? So I feel that this comes with responsibility. And then more and more the world is shaped by the things we build. Right? And then I think we need the spirit of this open source to, uh, to help us build something better. So what do you want to build? Um, well, just do it. <laughs> All right, I do have a few uh, bonus slides, but I can take some uh, questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Uh.